Hello and welcome to Car Dealer Live. My name is James Batchelor and today on the show we are talking about new car sales. Now I think it's fair to say the new car market has had a, a roller coaster ride in 2020 and in contrast to used car sales it's very much borne the brunt of the uncertainty felt by consumers and the physical effects of lockdown with showrooms and factories closed. Now, but what is, the, what is the state of the current market? Uh, what has consumer demand been like? And has consumer buying behavior changed? How is the market adapting to an influx of electric cars? And what about digital and omni-channel retailing? And finally, are we at the stage where dealers' digital forecourts have never been so important? So, uh, well, to chat about that and much more, uh, I have three very special guests. They are Mark Potter, Head of UK Sales at Jaguar Land Rover, John Smith, uh, Swansway Group Director, and Car Dealer Live regular Ian Plummer, Director at Auto Trader. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Good morning. Lovely to have you all on. Um, we've got a lot to get through. This is a very big topic. Um, so it would be great if we could just sort of jump in, if, if I may. Um, John, can I can I turn to you first, please? Um, with England, you know, gripped in lockdown two, and Wales just coming out of its uh, fire break lockdown. Um, what are the implications of this second lockdown? I mean, are retailers, do you think, better prepared this time round? Um, and and for you personally, I mean, what have you taken away from the first uh, lockdown? Well, I think the implication, first of all, is that obviously. We're going to make a loss. Um, there's going to be a loss in sales. Um, I think dealers are doing the best they can to uh, mitigate that. And I think after sales, certainly as a group, we are looking to run at 100%. However, we are looking at daily bookings um, on a daily basis. And we can see that bookings are starting to soften a little. Uh, and that means we've got to get more out of the work that we're getting. Uh, from a sales perspective, uh, obviously, we're closed officially, uh, but op open digitally. Um, and so we've got to make sure we're absolutely obsessed by our digital presence and we um, be obsessed by our, our lead management as well. Uh, we've got to absolutely follow every single lead that comes into our dealerships in the next four weeks if we're going yeah. to make success of the month. Um, uh, without doubt, dealers, I think, are better set up for uh, lockdown two. I think lockdown one was horrific the week before was horrific we had to make decisions there that we've never had to make and i think that what we did in lockdown one has, has set has set the place for uh, lockdown two so it was pretty less a lot less stressful uh, going into that obviously furlough scheme came into 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 force and we had to sort that out but apart from that um i think lockdown two has been a lot less stressful yeah yeah and I mean, I can't imagine what it must have been like when lockdown was announced and you had to shut your showrooms and physically lock them and not wondering when, when you're going to come out of this. Um, yeah, and, and I'm sure, you know, for, for you know, dealers who know that they can rely upon, you know, a good manufacturer who can support them throughout all of this. And I know Jaguar Land Rover has been supporting their dealers a lot throughout all of this. Um, Mark, can I just turn to you now? Um, I mean, despite expectations of a, a strong September and a strong October, I mean, new car registrations, let's face it, were, were fairly muted, weren't they? I mean, has COVID been particularly challenging for, for new car sales? I think globally, yeah, I would I'd certainly agree with you, James, that muted September figures, not the disasters we, looked, we were anticipating early on in the year, far from it, but it, it, it's, it's been the... I, I, the, I, quite the reverse for Jaguar Land Rover over since since coming back after the first lockdown. I think um, we we enjoyed a real bounce back at the end of Q2 and to to come out from looking after sales in the UK to come out of quarter three um, at more or less the same levels of last year. Honestly, we would have we would have bitten your arm off for that type of performance. Um, to come out of, of the retailers uh, in such difficult situations. So our, our segments, our competitive segments, seem to be more resilient in the marketplace. That's certainly proving with ourselves and some of the, our competitors' performance levels. Um, 
it, our demographic demographic of customer perhaps is a little bit more insulated from the you know the, the pandemic effect. So that certainly is in some some instances strange circumstances, but we're seeing their disposable incomes even higher. And so um, to see that strengthen the the premium uh, SUV market and a lot of the, the uh, areas in which we uh, operate re- really positive so we've we were in the fortunate position to have plentiful stocks at the time that we came back in uh, quarter two quarter three and now it, we've we've amazingly kept our schedules on time for new model years new technologies throughout the quieter times of the, when factories themselves were closed but keeping on on track for that has been outstanding um but i think no, november is has, has been a, a, tr- a slightly trickier start the additional challenges of a different type of lockdown so although we're in a we're in a, we're in a, we're in a almost you know perfect situation where our stock levels are lean and we're taking orders future orders that were so we're in a demand led uh, franchise at the moment which is a, a fantastic position to be in. So, you know, really positive for us, despite all of the circumstances we find ourselves in. Yeah. yeah. If, I, if I could just jump in there, I think yeah. we should salute the efforts of the of the retailers and brands that have gone through these challenging times. And John touched on the things we've learned, Mark, on the things that the brands have done to support and learn as well. But if you look at the, the headline on uh, the, the sort of muted headline, if you like, as you called it, for the sales numbers on new cars for September and October, I think it, it belies the underlying strength of the retail numbers that we've seen in the last couple of months, and particularly the fact that the retail market has not been as pushed in the back end of each month. We've not seen the same sort of overheating, uh, short cycle fleet business in particular, or the self-registration or extra demonstrator type business that's so often crippled the new car market and has effects on the used car market, blurs the boundary between new and used, makes it harder to make an efficient used car operation work, uh, destroys your new car profitability over time. And that's something we should be um, positive on. And if you look at how the UK performs compared to many other European or international markets, we've done extremely well. The shape of the curve is a V for the last few months without the levels of incentives that I do think we need to support EV sales and so on in particular. But I think we should take the hats off collectively to the to the work that everybody's done to get to that point. I think it's fantastic, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, especially launching a big car like Defender in the middle of a global pandemic is not, it's not particularly easy, but the, the, the strength of the sales of that car have shown that, yes, there is a bit of disposable income out there. And also, it, you know, it's, it's the old adage of, of you know, it's a, fa- it's a car that's fashionable and that demand is naturally going to increase for something like that. Um, and it brings in a new type of customer. So um, it's been interesting to see the launch of a new car such as Defender at a time where, you know, showrooms have been shut, hasn't, hasn't it, Mark? Yeah, I think with Defender, uh, <laughs> to have all of the pent-up demand and, and literally when we opened up the doors for post-lockdown, the f- first lockdown, that was really the first deliveries of Defender in earnest. So. It was it was a really positive way to come out of lockdown. We've had all this demand, we have all the orders, the vehicles were, were there at the impact at the, the compounds ready to rock for a big march, and then boom, they go all all the uh, the, the the gates were closed. Yeah. So post lockdown, I think it gave you know gave us a, a big morale boost, and certainly for the retailers to have all that effect. Being able to deliver a fantastic car like the the Defender has been has been has been fantastic. That, I mean that we, although it's 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 curtailed some of our Defender 90 and hardtop uh, showroom activity in November uh, uh, inevitably, um, it's was still on track amazingly to get those vehicles out on time, which I think you know from 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 my perspective is is fantastic and the order bank for those is is growing. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ian, can we just get down to some granular data here? And, uh, and, and what has Autotrader been seeing in terms of the effects of the lockdown and, you know, the tighter restrictions, I mean, more broadly on, on, on car buyers? Um, yeah, firstly, I'd state that the, the restrictions we've seen across the various parts of the UK over 
you know, recent weeks and months, in essence, hadn't had an impact. So whether it be the, the Northwest, Northeast, we saw uh, Wales, parts of Scotland under restrictions, there was no discernible impact on the share of uh, voice, if you like, that uh, the stock or the consumers were getting, if you like, in those areas. So um, that was very positive. As we've gone into lockdown in a broader way across obviously the whole of England, um, there has been an impact, but we're in nothing like the, the sort of same situation we were in in lockdown one. Now we saw an initial dip of, of uh, consumer interest and so on on our site, the audience numbers, the visits, visitors and so on. But we started from a very high position. You know, we were running at around 25% up year on year, massive numbers, record numbers, 2 million uniques coming uh, for visit visitors, I beg your pardon, coming every day. So we, we started from a higher place. So we dipped on those numbers, um, but we've now already returned in the uh, just last few days over the, over the weekend to roughly just under 20% up year on year for, for our visits and visitor numbers. So that's fantastic. We, I think we saw an initial dip as people like me, I don't know about you, were out doing some shopping for a few things I needed to get, maybe going to a restaurant before they were closed. But um, I think people have come back into the car buying journey that they may have interrupted temporarily. So it's a good sign. Um, yeah. Leeds, for example, were up 34.5% uh, over the weekend. What we have seen a dip in, as we did in the last lockdown, was people clicking on map views um, and, uh, you know, the more uh, uh, late stage physical parts of the journey. So web clicks into retailer websites are down as well. But crucially, when we ask consumers on the site whether their confidence is impacted, you know, we ask questions such as, has the government announcement affected your decision to purchase the vehicle? And 81% said either no or I'm not sure. So very few, uh, very low percentage are, are feeling put off. And confidence is uh, really high. We, we ask people to rate their affordability confidence. And that number is actually growing in October. Uh, it's at around eight and a half out of 10 in terms of affordability index. That number was below eight before lockdown, even at you know, the end of last year. So generally consumer confidence feels good. And I'm expecting on the bounce of the vaccine news where the stock market rose, probably confidence will feel even higher in the next couple of days and more. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think confidence is strong. Demand is strong, even though, you know, behind the negative headlines, demand is strong. Sure. Um, John, I mean, what, what's your feelings about this? I mean, you know, more, more customers are wanting to transact and do, you know, a larger proportion of the sales process online. With that in mind, how are you able to stand out from your competitors? I mean, how can you maintain a, you know, a consistent experience between your online and your offline channels? Yeah, um, I, I think most dealer groups actually went to an end, end to end online process during uh, lockdown one. So that's obviously in place now. Uh, and, and that probably brought us forward a number of years because I think we were thinking about it, but then decided, oh, well, it's not important enough to do it. And, and, and it was the thing, COVID was the thing that actually pushed us through it, as most groups do. Um, I think. We have, as I said previously, we, we've become obsessed with our uh, digital presence. In fairness, I think Ian will back me up on this. I think we were quite quickly onto the auto trade and new car uh, platform. I think we were one of the first dealer groups. And uh, we saw the benefit of that um, early doors, probably three years ago. Um, and what we've done, we've been on a journey where we started off. I remember when I first started in motor trade, uh, someone would get you to come with a black and white camera and take photographs of your car. And then a week later, they go in and they go out and it, the publication would come out on a Thursday. And, um, you know, you, hopefully you'd sell a car. Um, nowadays, uh, what we've decided is that we are not relying on someone to take a photograph. We, we're actually employing professional uh, people to actually take our photographs and do our video online. And we've done an in-house um uh, marketing course for uh, what we call digital marketers and these guys are like mid-20s just come out of either graduated from university come out of college probably can't find a job uh, in fact we recruited about six during lockdown we had 500 applicants for those six positions and um, we've trained them to do professional videos professional photographs and we've absolutely become obsessed by a digital presence um, I mean, by, by obsessed, I mean, I won't allow a car online without photographs. And many sales managers will always point to the, the car that they've sold, which hasn't got any photographs. But it just doesn't make your digital forecourt look good having a coming soon uh, uh, badge on there. 
Um, so we won't allow any cars without photographs. And my theory is that if I won't allow one, that means the sales manager will make sure that photograph, photographs go on quicker. So um, from that perspective, uh, we've looked at turntables, and but we found out that iPhones actually produce better photographs. Um, and we have, uh, obviously with the, with Autotrader, we've worked with, closely with Autotrader as to how many each uh, car has, how many photographs each car has. We're looking for a minimum of 25 and um, a personal commented uh, video of 70%. So if you click on one of my, uh, on our website, hopefully you'll find uh, cars with individual commentary on the car telling, taking you all around the car and basically the, the photographs go in the way that a customer would walk around the car. So we start at one place, walk around the car, then move inside. And that's what I mean by being obsessed because I, I go on many a site and I'll see uh, yeah, a wing of a car, then I'll see the dashboard of a car. And that's not a way a customer looks at it. Uh, and that's the detail that we've had to go into. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Ian, you, 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 listen, you listen to to John there and he's, you know, he's saying he's employing staff to handle these kinds of inquiries who are specifically tasked with doing this kind of job. You know, we're, you know, during the summer, you know, dealers have had to, you know, do click and collect. They've had to do virtual walk around. I mean, this is here to stay, isn't it? This is this is going to have a massive impact on, on the industry, you know, the, the times that we've seen this year. I, I totally agree, James. It's definitely here to stay. And John's quite right. He, he's, his focus on standout is really key. You've got to stand out for the crowd, as is the focus on consistency, making sure consumers see a consistent journey on all your different channels, your own website, a third-party site like ours, a, a brand site as well. And then having the same experience on the on the retailer forecourt in the showroom as well, that blended retailing approach, it's got to join things together, make it easy to do. But that shift that you talk about definitely seems to have happened. Um, and it seems like it's a lasting one. You know, if we look at the data today, nearly three quarters of consumers are saying they're open to a click and collect solution or home delivery one. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's fantastic to see that retailers have got themselves in a good shape to do that. And uh, the vast majority of people are doing more online. 42% of people want to do more of the, on, the, of the buying stages, the jobs to be done online. So the industry is responding with, with the right measures here and making the shift that the consumer really wants to see. I think we should recognize, recognize perhaps as well that it's not as hard to do as uh, we sometimes uh, convince ourselves. You know, on Autotrader, we've tried to you know, bring that journey to life just recently. Last week, launched our, our online buying sort of journey where you've got now uh, 450 or so thousand uh, cars that are available for research and search. That's great. That's my first phase of buying a car. You can look through cars. The majority of those will be available for uh, click and collect type of delivery. In the second phase, I might use a Zoom call, for example, to negotiate the, the car. I might exchange uh, finance details and sign the docs on an email. All those things are you know, things I can again do from home. And then the third phase, I can actually get the car delivered, like I said, with a click and collect or home delivery. We've now got 213,000 cars on the site where the retailers have updated their data to say that they're, they're happy to do a home delivery. So all of that means we've embraced what the consumer wants, made it easier for them to buy cars from their own home. And that's what they're cl clearly keen to do in other products. I noticed yesterday the, the boss of uh, Ocado was talking to the markets on their excellent, excellent results and talk, talked about the fact that they'd, they'd seen years of growth in the online grocery market condensed into a matter of months. And, we, and his, his comment was that we won't be going back. And it really feels like we've made a shift for car buyers. It's been good for the consumer. And as John pointed out, when embraced fully, it can be really good in terms of efficiency for the, for the retailer. And I think fantastic in terms of consistency and reach for the, for the, for the brand as well. So there's absolutely no reason why we'd be going backwards. It's in everyone's interest to make this happen. Yeah. Definitely. Sorry, sorry, James. I think, Ian, I think it's just, just on your part point. Of their DNA. Sorry, so, uh, it's just a, a dealer's DNA now that actually it's so so important. It, I, I I often say it's more important to get your cars online than it is on your pitch. Yeah, yeah. I think it was interesting, James. Just when, when Ian said there is is that three month lockdown period for the first lockdown. It was, it was almost as if ev all the operational and uh, normal activity was was parked for a period of time and you had so much of an intense period of r d where people said right what have we got to do differently so all the normal meetings went out of the diary and it was totally rescheduled of 
right, what do we need to do differently? What do we need? How do we need to work in a different manner? And that just honestly, the condensed of people thinking and developing something different over a, over a period of time just rocketed lots of things forward. Yeah, yeah. I think I think all of us have been amazed at how quickly things have been catalyzed in yeah. during this year. But but with that, you know, such is the pace of change, you know, um, relationships between manufacturers and dealers can suffer, can't can't it? So um, but I do feel as though um, the industry has sort of pulled together, it's rallied together during 2020, um, particularly so during lockdown one. I mean, Mark, do you do you see that's the same thing that's happening in, in lockdown two? Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm relatively new to the JLR family. Um, so joining in February, just prior to lockdown, my um, I'm almost, I guess, a a COVID leader. So I've been born, my, my experience with working with the network has been totally remote. Um, all of my relationships I've experienced, a large majority of, have been remotely, have been through teams, through different personnel. So it is has been a, a, a very strange period of time for me. But um, being you know newer to JLR, I, I've just been amazed at the, the degree in which they we have the integration of the network into what we decide we do so from an investor insights direction um, conversation to a retail board which is sales and after sales more on strategy uh, maybe on a 12 month horizon and then you have different committees which are sales and marketing to look at a quarter look at the actions look at the the competitor look at the landscape look at the market so those that you know there have been some really fun teams calls to be fair it's been honestly it's been it's, it's been really enjoyable they they you know the uh, my retailer colleagues might not say the same from for me to me only remotely but no we've it, it's not been business as usual it's been businesses uh, and business has been better through this interaction with uh remote no no commuting no uh, meetings, hotels, no, no, none of the distractions. It fits into everybody's um, uh, time frame and agenda. It's, it's just been, it's been really good. So all of the decisions and all of the support packages and all of the commercial stances, they've all been taken in, in, in conjunction with the network. I've never seen it stronger. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree with you, Mark, although I am sitting next to a pile of washing here that's drying. So <laughs> it's, 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 not, it's not quite as professional as you, as, as you may be making it out to be sometimes. So, but anyway, so. <laughs> um, John, now uh, we're, in, we're in the early stages of November. Um, we've got the rest of the month and December. I mean, it's traditionally the quietest time of the year. Um, what's, it, what's your strategy like in, in managing these leader months? I mean, how can you prepare for a can you actually prepare at the moment for a um, well, quarter it's, one? It's difficult. It's difficult. But I mean, November uh, and December are difficult months in any case, given a uh, lockdown too. It's uh, put even more pressure on dealers. Um, we, you tend to find that dealers have made their money and it's just keeping hold of the money they've made um, usually in November and December. Obviously, at the end of the year, there's some chuckings uh, uh, when the balance sheet's cleaned up. Uh, but usually... November, December are, are tough months. And I guess um, it's may be made harder by lockdown too. Um, as I say, we're looking to do about 50% of what we'd normally do. We're aiming to do 50% of the sales, even though we're closed um, in November. Uh, and then obviously you've got um, the Brexit question as well um, with an, an RDE compliant cars at the end of December. So. Uh, there are some hurdles along the way, uh, but we're, we're quite, uh, in the motor trade, we're quite good at overcoming those kind of things. Uh, from a staff point of view, I guess it's keeping them motivated. Um, some will want to take holidays that they've obviously, uh, we've, uh, you know, we've kept a lot of our good people in whilst um, uh, other people have been furloughed. And, and I guess uh, some of those are, uh, slightly burnt out but what I would say I have signed off some big commission checks these last few months so um, you know um, they have our, our salespeople have earned extremely well. 
Yeah, Ian, um, I, I, I'm amazed that we've got to this stage uh, in the in the conversation, not said the B word, but let's use the B word Brexit. I mean, there are some big challenges coming our way, you know, once we come out of COVID. Um, what do you think the opportunities are? I mean, what's what's your outlook? I think, to be honest, James, the outlook is pretty positive. I mean, even just to finish on your last point around you know, December and so on, as John touched on, you'll be still selling some cars in November that we ordered in October, and we'll still be selling some cars in December that people were looking at in, uh, in October. We, typical uh, search journey lasts around 60 days. One of the reasons we put the support in place we did for the retailer networks and our partners through uh, November, and in particular into December, was that you know, 67% of people who buy a car in January would have looked at the car in, in December. So it's vital that everybody really focuses on the positives. And that really goes back to answer your question. Where are the opportunities? They're in doing the things that John and Mark have talked about that we've learned to do differently. And that digital acceleration that we've all gone through in the last few months. And if some retailers or brands haven't quite got there in the last phase, maybe they thought it wasn't quite so necessary. I think they're seeing now, again, lockdown makes it necessary. But beyond lockdown, it's a permanent shift. So Brexit clearly lingers on the horizon as you said um we're all hopeful that there'll be some sort of positive conclusion personally um you know i don't lose sleep over it uh, but i'm definitely not overly um optimistic although i reassure myself with the fact that generally these things are done in uh, in the corridors at the last minute so i'm hoping that that's going to be the case again here the industry massively needs it however if brexit is good to go badly i think the only thing we could look at as a positive is that some um, although that will impact new car volumes and pricing, obviously. That should leave space for used car pricing to go even further. We've seen massive used car price increases, as you know, sort of still tracking that way at the, at the moment this month. Um, so used car uh, pricing should stay good, uh, room to grow even further, but equally the used car volumes will be, will be very solid. So that's the worst case scenario. Aside from all that, if you bear in mind all the other com uh, context we've shared before, you know, We've talked about household incomes earlier. Mark mentioned that. Uh, I mentioned pricing still being good. So finance rates are still very attractive. So you can get a very great monthly payment. The cost of money is really low. Household incomes obviously can afford that. People need their cars. I mentioned consumer confidence. They, they still be, believe in their affordability. Their ownership focus is still high on wanting to uh, drive a car, particularly instead of public transport. So all those factors that led to the sort of 25% growth we saw for five straight months in terms of our audience levels. We're confident that looking forward, unless something major derails that, and who knows with Brexit, we can't pre, uh, prejudge that one, then we should be relatively confident looking forward into 2021 as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mark, I, I feel as though we're, we're talking about new cars and, and not talking about low emission cars and electric cars seems quite remiss. You know, this year we've seen enormous percentage increases for, for um, you know, eco-friendly cars, particularly battery electric cars. Um, do you think now is the time for people to, to buy something new or do you think car buyers are sticking to, to what they know? And, and secondly, um, I mean, the industry faces increasing CO2 legislation and greater government pressure. How has all of this impacted your electric car strategy? Well, but certainly the, 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 the ironically, the, the lockdown phases has allowed us, I guess, to move forward significantly with our with our strategy. We move forward with a combination now with eight PHEV derivatives, mild hybrid evolutions on, on larger on larger vehicles, which is which is more of a, a challenge. And as well as having the the I pace Bev, which I'm a big advocate owner of so we, we've, we've, we've moved forward significantly and importantly it, that it hasn't stifled our development and production of it it hasn't brought us back could it been I think it could have actually you know the, the, the lockdown actually has probably hindered its probably evolution ironically where other trends have accelerated it could have gone even further with perhaps um, uh, business decisions deferred more than retail decisions i think it's moved forward but it could have gone even further so for, for us i guess a little bit of a win where whilst we didn't have the p all of our complete p have range available the deferment of all of those you know uh, business purchases um will have will have will have gone in our favor to be fair i think yeah yeah James, if i can just jump in quickly on this one <clears throat> i think it's a 
a real challenge for the industry. I touched earlier on the, the levels of support we, we don't have actually in, the, in general terms in the UK industry compared to France, Germany and others. And the fact that we need it specifically on EVs. Fundamentally at the moment, EVs are, still face a, a price problem. You know, we, we, we see great growth, growth rates. You mentioned that. So 29, sorry, 2020 has seen sales already so far this year that have exceeded what we sold from 2010 through to 2018 of EVs. Doubling share, well, that's great. But actually, when we look at the data on our site and the demographic comparisons of the EV intenders, we've roughly got 7.3% last count of our audience that are looking at an EV more than 30% of the time they spend on our site. When we analyze who they are, there's no rural or, or sort of urban divide there. What you've basically got is, is a status where EV intenders are older and wealthier than other car buyers. You have to be able to afford an EV and people with a higher EV preference, basically uh, in, in uh, income brackets, much higher than the average. So over half of them are in the more than 50,000 pound income brackets. That compares to around 34% for all car buyers. So fundamentally, we know that the EVs are more expensive to produce. That's the manufacturer challenge which they're grappling with. But if Boris Johnson is preparing himself next week or whatever to make big announcements on EVs and, and more rhetoric, I think we just really need to see the substance behind the government support because you've got it in France where you can get an EV at the same sort of price as nice. You need to see that over here in the UK as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're, talking about used car, we're talking about new cars here. In the used car market, you and I have spoken about this before, it's an entirely different situation as well, isn't it? So it's going to be, like you say, it's going to be something that's going to be, you know, it's going to be a growing theme and one we're going to be paying close attention to, really, um, where there's going to be any incentive. UVV is literally twice the average value of an ICE vehicle on our platform. Yeah, exactly. So very different picture. Um, lastly, gentlemen, we're going to have to come to an end um, on this, but um, it's about giving... Uh, you know, one, one piece of advice to, uh, to to retailers, John. I know you're a retailer, but what would what would what would you uh, what would be your one piece of advice? Well, I, I think just look at look at your website and compare it to the competition. I think um, one thing that COVID and the disruptors have done is make dealers up their game. But I think you've got to ask yourself how you, how do you compare? Because um, you know there are some good people out there. Um, and they'll take our business if, uh, if, if we allow it. Brilliant. Ian, same question to you. What would be your one piece of advice? I think we've touched on it several times, but it's get, it's get behind digital retail and get behind that online buying process that we're all putting in place. Uh, work together in partnership to make it happen and get consistency and transparency and embrace that. It's good for the consumer. And surely as businesses, we should always recognise what's good for the consumer is going to be good for us ultimately if we can uh, be among the winners in giving them what they what they're looking for. Okay, fantastic. And uh, COVID leader Mark, what's uh, what would be? <laughs> that doesn't come from nowhere. Uh, that, that's very kind of you to refer to that. Um, probably it's 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 the resource for for retailers, um, not to not to rule with uh, uh, an abacus or a calculator and not make decisions solely on on that basis prior to experiencing what what level of demand is, is there within your business and certainly have the, the, the capacity to cope with the influx of online digital new inquiries, but don't forget about the retention actions that need to be there for customers who are, who are, who are tied into PCPs and, and, and business contract hire. Make sure that there's enough resource there to, to cope with both, both areas. Fantastic. Okay, yeah. well, we're gonna we're gonna have to leave it there today. I'm afraid. I know this is a subject we're going to be returning to, but for today, it's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Wade. Uh, if you if you'd like to be on the card of your life, just like this one, then please do email me James at blackballmedia.co.uk. But until next time, thanks for watching. Bye bye.